three, two, one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and welcome to this webinar on digital and online learning in VET in Serbia. My name is Mark Wright, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers uh, today uh, on the webinar. So we have in the studio Alessandro Bropito, who's Knowledge Management and Innovation Specialist at ETF. Uh, in Serbia, we have Jelena Radisic, Radisic Research Associate at the Institute for Educational Research. Good morning. We have Daniela Shepanovic, who's Education Policy Analyst at the Ministry. And we have Michael Lightfoot, International E-Learning Consultant. Welcome, everybody, to the studio and to the event. But first of all, I'd like to introduce, if I may, Arjun Voss, who is Deputy Head of Operations here at the, at the ETF to give an institutional welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, which is a, a, a bit of a new phenomenon for us. So I think we uh, hope to learn a lot from this experience, but also how to, let's say, this, this will work out uh, with all of you. Uh, the ETF, for those who uh, don't know the ETF, is an uh, agency of the European Union um, supporting uh, the uh, countries outside of the European Union borders in, let's say, uh, developing their uh, vocational education training system uh, and to make vocational edu education training more relevant to the labor market. We are talking about uh, online uh, learning, and um, I think it is an important uh, part of the agenda of, of the European Union, the so-called uh, digital uh, agenda for, for Europe, which, let's say, uh, recognizes that, uh, on the one hand, the, let's say the, the job requirements will change enormously. At the same time, um, uh, people are, let's say, getting in their jobs more and more uh, to do with uh, digi digital requirements and also for the personal life, it is important to, to be as competent as, as possible. Uh, the European Union also is trying to stimulate uh, digital online learning in, in schools, the digital online in courses, uh, the use of, uh, of the digital um, um, uh, methodologies for, for education and let's say I think that that is an important uh, priority of the European Union uh, these days. That we are not maybe yet there in Europe, um, let's say, would show the experience of my, of my daughter who is 15 years old who goes to an Italian school who, um, uh, let's say, gets very traditional education who has teachers that are, let's say, mostly not very digitally uh, skilled. Uh, so basically there's the old classroom technique and the old traditional methods. But then when she comes home, she sudden, suddenly changes her uh, learning attitudes and she uses her mobile telephone and uses it for many different ways, for the good and for the bad. Uh, for the bad is, of course, well, copying uh, homework uh, of others, uh, but at the same time, uh, she's also using it as an, a way of discussing problems um, um, that, uh, let's say, that the homework requires. Um, she uses it for social networking. So basically, outside the school, let's say the digital world is existing, but inside the school, it seems that let's say not much is happening. And the challenge now is, well, how to combine that? And is uh, there a role for the schools in teaching digital competences? Because most of the children already have digital competences before they go to school. So therefore, let's say that's for me the, the, the main challenge. And uh, in, in, let's say, what can the school do and what can the school not do? and what should the school do and what the, the, the school should not do, and of course the teachers. So I'm very much interested in, uh, in uh, listening to the discussions and to what you have been doing, in particular in Serbia, uh, and um, I wish you all a very good webinar. Again, thank you very much for that introduction. Now, if you have any questions at all uh, during the sessions, please 
um, use the question function which you have here on GoToWebinar and just type your questions in at any point that you like and then we'll be going to them uh, later on in the program. Okay, so now let me introduce Alessandro uh, to start us off. Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Arjun, for opening uh, this webinar. Um, let's start, uh, before uh, going into the details uh, of the case study, let's start uh, looking a bit uh, to the digital online learning paradigm and why this is important uh, in our modern societies. Uh, let's say that uh, we are definitely living a digital revolution. In the past we have to face an industrial revolution and we are now in the middle of a digital revolution where citizens in everyday life they are using on a regular basis digital devices to trade, to work, to keep social relations as well. Uh, let's say that the capacity of our education and training system to effectively embed uh, new technologies uh, in the education context uh, is key to the social prosperity. It's a matter of matching the skill requested in our day-to-day -day life uh, and what the school is uh, providing. And as you see where we are now, in my understanding, the schools uh, uh, and the education system in general is not keeping the pace uh, with the development uh, in technologies. Uh, so we have to do more to bring, uh, as Aria was mentioning, quite often uh, our students uh, are expecting more IT in our schools, but nevertheless it's still not available. Now, looking to Serbia, uh, for sure, Serbia is, is, is part of this revolution. I'm sharing with you a few figures from an OECD report published in September concerning 15 years old students focusing on formal education and the, train, and the trends between 2009-2012. As we can see from these figures, probably infrastructure is not anymore the main barrier to use uh, digital and online uh, methodology and technologies uh, in, in, uh, in the teaching and learning process, especially, as Aria was mentioning before, at home, where almost all the pupils uh, have a computer, not only, they have uh, internet access. Nevertheless, also in Serbia, the situation in the school is a bit different. And uh, I think it's uh, a bit bad, for example, the 8.8 .8 pupils per school uh, PC, which is uh, a double than the OECD average. So in the schools, uh, in the classroom, the technology is partially present uh, in Serbia, but uh, it's definitely part uh, of this revolution. So let's move to the next slide, uh, where we see in my understanding, the three main pillars uh, in digital online learning. Uh, for sure, we have to we have to think about uh, to the uh, use of computers, uh, desktop, uh, mobile devices. Uh, the four we I'm referring to uh, of of the smartphone. On uh, I'm speaking of tablet. So the technology is accessible. And then there is also an element that is linked to the distance learning based and powered by internet and web 2.0 services such as, uh, uh, let's say, learning management system, social platform, network drive. These are examples of resources that are available sometimes also for free and they extend the capacity of our education system to outside the classroom. Last but not least, uh, for the European Union, there is another important element, which is uh, the, uh, the use of open educational resources, uh, which are resources uh, in the public domain, or resources uh, that uh, are licensed through an open license, uh, which means uh, you can use uh, this license uh, and you can tailor this license to the specific needs uh, of your pupils. Okay, let's move to the next slide uh, where basically we 
try to see what does it mean in concrete terms uh, to apply digital online learning in, in a classroom. And let me say it's about, uh, about uh, what is the most and the best lesson we can deliver. It's probably a lesson where the focus is on the learner, where has a, an, has an active participant, where is taking control and responsibility according to his own capacity to the learning process. May, he might go, get in touch with the teachers online, he might get in touch and read the book uh, that the school is, uh, is uh, providing, or he might go on the internet and to find a, a very good video in this respect and play as many times as it wants. He might submit a, a work uh, electronically to the teacher, and the teacher might, for example, highlight uh, tracking, tracking changes, uh, what was wrong in his work. ICT is not the end of the story, but it's an excellent enable, enable for innovative pedagogies. I'm thinking, for example, to the flip classroom, where really the pupils, our pupils, are taking control of the learning process. And this is everything facilitated by the teacher that has to guide them, advise them, rather than giving prescriptive instructions. And the benefits are very clear. We are speaking of digital native students. We are speaking of people that really want to use to be engaged in ICT and technologies and internet. And uh, they want also to express themselves to their very best, uh, tailoring the specific the learning process to their specific uh, cognitive capacities and perhaps to study even in the evening or in the night if they want. And let me say that the last benefit that I mentioned in this slide, it's very important for adults. They have family, they have a work, they need to get access to knowledge and to skills, perhaps in a non-formal way, but they are still skills. And this capacity provided by ICT to get access anytime, anywhere, it's absolutely great, a great opportunity for our education systems. So, having said that, we say that uh, the pupils is an active, takes responsibility, but there is a common understanding among experts and practitioners that nothing is happening, or let's say ICT has a, a little impact if there are no good teachers behind. If, uh, and teachers, uh, and when I speak of good teaching, uh, let's say, I'm not just referring to digital skills. Uh, these are, of course, a, a pillar, a precondition. But I'm thinking to teachers that are fully aware of what innovative pedagogies uh, are. And uh, let's say, if uh, we are in a context where we have just a computer in the room uh, or a smart whiteboard, uh, Nothing is going to really change unless the teacher is really orchestrating everything. And as you can see in this slide, I think this is a good point for initial vocational education and training, because we said we are speaking of digital native, because we expect to prepare people and see and the pupils in this case that has to enter in a digital world. If we think also to the work-based learning, and this is according to the Riga uh, conclusion, uh, is a priority. Well, they have to go in a factory and use uh, devices where they have a digital interface, a uh, uh, digital machine. So to have a, in the classroom the opportunity to use, for example, a simulation software to see how it works on the, the machine in the real world, that's it's great. And of course, for the CVT, as I said before, we have to face a, uh, our life is very complex, we know, and we have time constraint. And therefore, it's very important to have uh, the opportunity to get access everywhere, 70 days a week of 24 hours. Now, what I would like to highlight, uh, the, the introduction of digital online learning is supporting, of course, the development of digital skills, uh, but this is not the end of the story. 
innovative pedagogies uh, provide the opportunity to learner to, to develop learning skills, to develop social skills. Uh, they want to peer learning, they, to develop personal skills, uh, the creativity. We, work in, we live in a world where innovation is key to make business properly. And I mean, these kind of soft skills are absolutely demanded in our, in our world. And if we go to the, my last slide for this short introduction of the digital light paradigm, we just look a bit to the market demand. And this is, I mean, if you see from the note, it's about the USA market, but it's actually very similar, the situation for, 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 for Europe. And I think else in transition country like Serbia. So if we unpack the work in, in, this, in, in, in our society and we look to the task component, more and more non-routine interpersonal and non-routine analytic skills are necessary to perform properly, to get a job. And uh, the use of digital online learning methodology, they give the options to develop these uh, important skills. So that's why I think uh, I want to, we wanted to introduce before uh, going into the details of the case study to explain why digital online learning is uh, critical for the success of our education systems. Okay, Mark, I would pass the flow for the next part of the webinar. Excellent. Thank you very much for that introduction and that context. So now moving over to uh, Daniela Shefanovic in terms of the policy context. Over to you, Daniela. Daniela. Thank you, Mark. Um, hello again to everybody from Belgrade. I will shortly introduce the policy context in Serbia, mentioning main policy documents, describing policy orientation, and listing some of the policy tools, which are all expected to lead us to better integration of ICT into education sector, and particularly vocational education and training. Policy documents that provide roadmap for our future activities are certainly our education development strategy for the year 2020. And on the basis of that strategy, the action plan that was prepared by the ministry in 2015. Uh, in order to have more elaborated um, and thorough understanding of how ICT can be integrated into education sector, namely for the, pre, uh, uh, for the primary education and secondary education, we prepared uh, guidelines for advancing the integration of information and communication technologies in education. That was adopted by the National Education Council in 2013. This document has uh, more than 100 pages and more than 70 recommendations uh, targeting all actors of, uh, that are influencing education policy in Serbia. Also, our national policy orientation is tied with EU policy and integration process. Uh, we are participating in the negotiation process and we are responsible for use of the IPA funding for our reform activities. Serbia is participating in EU programs and the volume of this participation is increasing. It's participating in the Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 and other relevant programs. Also, Serbia is one of the candidate countries that is participating in the open method of coordination of the European Commission and has its representatives in the working group on digital and online learning. Uh, Serbia uh, has uh, a lot of preconditions for evidence-informed policy making. D this is due to participation in international and national studies such as PISA, TIMSS, TALIS. Uh, also, Serbia strongly supports participation in case studies, research, doing analysis and overviews, which is all, of course, in line with our availability of our resources, which we know that now are um, more and more uh, scarce. Um, we are continuing to open up. This means that we are now using more ICT for information sharing, improving ministries' website, using social networks to distribute information, and also we are trying to develop information system. 
um, there is an open data approach that is, uh, 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 let's say, lives in our ministry. This means that all uh, publicly important uh, data that are available to the ministry will be also to our website available to uh, researchers and all other interested parties. There are several policy tools currently in use that I would like to mention. One of them is uh, that we established expert group uh, on digital and online learning that has 16 members. And the expert group is working on the development of the first national ICT in education report. Also, we are using for the first time nationally adopted uh, ICT in education indicators. Uh, there is an at it attempt that within the next year uh, we develop digital competence frameworks for citizens, teachers and institutions and also to work on uh, recommendations for ICT infrastructure in order to uh, uh, find the cost-benefit uh, solution and provide sustainability of, uh, of, the, of this infrastructure. Currently there is a DigiPlus, um, the call for proposals, open until 20th of November targeting uh, uh, primary schools. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, also, we are organizing the uh, conference, New Technologies in Education. It's going to uh, be in, at the end of February in 2016. This is the biggest regional event on ICT in education. We are organizing it uh, with uh, our partners, namely with the uh, British Council targeting all levels of education and we are expect more than 4,000 participants on this uh, two-day event. Serbia is participating, just to mention European Code Week, uh, we are participating in e twinning program for 2015. Also ICT is uh, more and more present in our legal framework. So these are only uh, several policy tools that I mentioned, uh, but there are uh, certainly more. Now we have prepared a poll for you to answer, so please select uh, one of the answers uh, in the next uh, 10 seconds. The question is, uh, in what areas are the major system level developments related to digital and online learning within that system in Serbia? You, you may choose exams and assessment forms, investment in ICT infrastructure, teacher continuing education and training, teaching methods, or you think it's something else, um, uh, your it's your choice. Thank you. Lovely While day. we are uh, waiting for, uh, for answers. So you, you can select even more than one uh, option if you consider that more than one are suitable and relevant. Uh, just a few more votes coming in now. Make your votes now. And thank you. So? Okay. So, Jelena, what do you think of these results? <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. Teacher continuing education and training. Yeah. Teacher um, continuing education and training has uh, uh, certainly the um, majority uh, of votes. Uh, this is something that uh, has started uh, already in 2003. It's, it's been a long time since we are developing the system of professional development of teachers. And it is certainly a, a, a live and a very dynamic area. I am pleased to see this because this is the, the teacher competencies and teacher professional development is one of the main pillars for our success. Uh, personally, I thought that the infrastructure will be the uh, number one, but uh, according to the opinion of our participants is teacher continuing education and training. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely. Okay. And <clears throat> Okay. Back to you, Alessandra, on the... Uh... Uh, thank you. Thank you for the impressive list of initiatives at policy level uh, in, in Serbia. And uh, in this context, now it's time really to look closely to the case studies. Uh, 
the European Training Foundation, in close collaboration with the Ministry of Education of the Republic of Serbia, indeed uh, commissioned uh, a study with uh, two main purposes. Uh, to identify the demand of relevant policy and practices for digital learning, and uh, Daniela has already introduced uh, the most uh, important one, and of course uh, to analyze uh, the progress to date uh, and uh, to provide uh, some capacity development uh, recommendation according to what we found. As you may see from the map, uh, we visited school uh, in the major cities uh, of, uh, of, of, of Serbia. And uh, so let's move to the next slide where basically I want to link this uh, initiative uh, to the uh, European uh, uh, um, thematic working group on digital online learning. Uh, uh, this is an important uh, uh, element. In uh, this group uh, is uh, basically a group uh, chaired by the Director General for Education and Culture and uh, is supported by the Institute for Prospective Technological Studies uh, for scientific and research uh, support. At this group, uh, both ETF and Serbia are member, and uh, this uh, European initiative aim to define uh, policy guidance uh, mainly for the member states of the European Union, but uh, these are uh, as, as well applicable to the, uh, to the Serbia context, uh, for example. Specifically, uh, so this is a group of experts uh, from the member state uh, and also from candidate countries. Uh, and these are the main policy area that have been covered. I would like to draw your attention to the first output because the methodology adopted for the case study in Serbia was based on the European Framework for Digitally Competent Educational Organization. It's a framework that helped us to have a holistic, a systemic approach in the analysis of the state of play. And uh, on the basis of this framework, we developed uh, a set of guiding questions that uh, we uh, uh, addressed uh, to principals, uh, teachers, uh, and uh, pupils uh, for a total of 27 interviews. So, but now I would pass the floor to Yelena, and, uh, um, and she's going to introduce uh, the methodology in more detail to understand uh, and, the, and uh, better the result. Uh, and our recommendation for the VAT in, 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 and, and, and the use of digital online learning. So, Yelena. Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Belgrade again, and my name is Yelena Radicic. So, what are the important insights when it comes to methodology of this case study? As Alessandra already mentioned, we have eight uh, schools who took part in the case study and they were selected according to some very important principles based on the existing good practices uh, in those schools. And we have included a large scale of different actors who gave their advice on which schools should be part of this case study. We entered uh, major cities in Serbia and all schools we visited during the July of this year. And as uh, Alessandro mentioned, the European Framework for Digitally Competent Educational Organization was the reference point for us when we uh, made the instruments that we used in this case study, which means that all the interviews and the focus groups with the school principals, teachers, and students pretty much took this framework, and we wanted to have the insights bearing in mind the dimensions that the framework actually emphasizes. So when it comes to results of the case study, these are some of the highlights. In terms of the infrastructures, what we found is that all schools have very sound basic infrastructure. But what is interesting is that the cost of the hardware, the upgrades of the hardware, uh, anything concerning the software, uh, there is no sustainable uh, financial uh, framework to maintain everything. Actually, in all of the schools, everything has been uh, done through projects, through donors, so uh, largely all the needs are met by the donors. Uh, all schools have their own websites, and it's very important for them to keep 
all the data are very much up to date on what it concerns uh, their schools, the practices, and especially things that concern digital and uh, online learning practices. Uh, what we also found uh, as an important piece of information in this school, and this is something that is relevant to the entire system, this is the lack of system administrators in the school. This means that pretty much teachers are uh, those who keep track of the infrastructure, who maintain it, and this is something that, as we think, should not be part of their jobs. This is something that should be done by a system administrator. But unfortunately, in neither of the schools, such positions are fully emphasized, and this is something that actually hinders existing good practices. When it comes to leadership and governance practices, what we found is that in all the schools, school leaders are consistently, consistently and strongly in support of digital and online learning. Uh, but what is also interesting is that digital and online learning is not a common feature uh, or it's not explicitly visible in strategic planning of the schools. And to some extent, this is uh, connected to the lack of sustainable finance system because even the school leaders would say that sometimes it is quite difficult to plan on something if they do not know how the finance will go. What is also important uh, for the whole story on digital and online learning is that however all the school leaders state that they do feel that a critical mass of teachers who are committed and skilled and necessary in their schools do exist. And this is something that is important for the whole process. When it comes to next dimension, collaboration and networking, what we found is that Moodle is the learning management system of choice in all the schools that we have visited, but when it comes to, for example, practices like bringing your own device, this is something that is becoming a commonplace, but it remains somewhat a private endeavor because it's not backed up by some guidelines at the school level or that even minimum functional specifications uh, are being given. It is at the level that if students feel comfortable that they should bring their own devices, they simply do that. And this, the same goes for the teachers. When it comes to access to the Wi-Fi services in the schools, uh, the practices really vary in uh, this dimension. Uh, whereas in some schools we have very open networks, in the others the networks are opened uh, strictly during the school breaks. And uh, students are sometimes not allowed in these schools even to have internet services. Uh, in the computer labs unless they actually uh, need it for the uh, learning and the teaching uh, process. Uh, what is also uh, important to state is that a wide range of cloud-based storage uh, is being used both by the teachers and by the students, but only in case of one school we have uh, this organized at the system level provided by the school. Everything is based on the private accounts of both students and the teachers. And curricula. Uh, digital and online learning is evident across the curriculum in these schools in most of the subjects. But what we should also take into account is that we have entered into electroengineering uh, schools, computer uh, schools. So it does. This is some, somewhat connected with their original curricula. But when it comes to more general subjects like language, mathematics, history, uh, chemistry, uh, this is on the level of expression of te it is teacher dependent. And if a teacher is generally interested in digital and online learning, this, then these practices are very much uh, visible. Uh, what we found is that there is some of hazy understanding in relation to digital property rights, both by the teachers and uh, by the students, that this is something that is yet to be regulated. But most importantly, also when it comes to safe policies, to a large extent, they really do not exist in the school that we have visited. When it comes to open source repositories, uh, they're being used by teachers, but we do feel that this is still an underrepresented uh, tool and that, some, uh, that it can be used differently and more uh, in the future. When it comes to teaching and the learning process per se. Uh, in 
the schools that we uh, visited, we can say that we have one third of teachers are very keen on adult users, that we have one third of, let's say, beginners when it comes to incorporating their own, uh, into own practices, and one third of teachers who still feel very violent and not being interested in actually uh, dealing with adults. Uh, what is also uh, important to say is that this, uh, although teachers are often strongly committed to digital and online learning, there are very little transformational practices in evidence in most cases. And to s largely this is due to the fact that teachers have uh, made progress when it comes to, an enormous progress when it comes to using the hardware and the software, but very little training has been given in terms of how actually profoundly your teaching and learning process is changed when you're in a different environment. So teachers are learning themselves. And when it comes to social media, they're of course being used in the process very widely by both teachers and students, but mostly as a means of communication. Uh, the teachers do feel that they are more uh, uh, available to the students also this way. And finally, when it comes to assessments, there are two important pieces of the puzzle. Uh, in terms of uh, assessment practices uh, related to student achievement, uh, summative assessment is something that prevails in Serbia. And although, for example, within uh, Moodle, especially Moodle platform that is being used by the schools, uh, much testing is uh, taking place. It is again at the level of uh, summative assessment and what is also important to stress is that this is some, somewhat, it's not uh, at the primary level in terms that uh, teachers do feel that they cannot control the process as much, especially when it comes to, for example, student cheating, if something is being done online. So they do stress that they need more support in how to organize assessment in the online environment. But when it comes to formative practices, they're pretty much non-existing. Something that would, for example, resemble to if e portfolios, it's rather a scarce practice. And finally, when it comes to impact assessment in terms of to what extent determined online learning uh, is changing the school as a whole, uh, there are no strictly focused assessment practices uh, for this alone. Rather, uh, assessment is embedded in the school self-evaluation reports that are being used for the past decade in our schools. Thank you, and I, I now give my floor to Michael. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, well, after our, obviously our long voyage through all parts of uh, Serbia, we managed to distill our findings down into um, policy recommendations both at a system level and at a school-based level. So at the, at the system level, uh, I think the emphasis is very strongly upon uh, professional development, as Daniela was pointing out at the, at the early part of the seminar. Um, I think the important point is that it's not just about functional competence we're talking about here, we're talking about uh, uh, the, the pedagogy of, of uh, teaching and learning with ICC. So I, I think the, the um, professional development needs to go beyond just ECDL competence, for example. It needs to go to a, uh, teaching and learning with um, ICC and, and how it's a different paradigm of teaching and learning. The shift is from the te teacher to the student and it's much more about a learner pull than a teacher push. Now that's a very profound change and, and that will require quite a cultural transformation uh, to be encouraged at a, at a system level from the ministry. That's the first point, a very, very important point about culture change. The second point is, is a, just a practical point about the need for every institution to have a network administrator. What we found was that very often um, a teacher, an individual teacher, has that responsibility uh, and firstly they find themselves um, being taken away from their regular teaching role to perform a technician role and secondly they're not often that well equipped to be able to have the range of skills necessary to be a network administrator. 
Now, I think the important point here is that it's not just a technician <clears throat> we're talking about here. We want somebody who uh, can mediate between the technology and the pedagogy so that they can encourage teachers to use the, the um, technology in a creative in a creative way which encourages the students to be more um, active as learners. So a network administrator, that's the second point. The third point is to do with, um, I suppose, distance learning um, facilitated through digital and online environment. What we found was that given the large number of travellers and uh, students who are travelling a long way to um, the, the places of study, uh, insufficient, uh, uh, there's a, a too smaller role of the, the distance learning aspect. So, for example, a flipped classroom implementation could be very effective here, so that, for example, students who are travelling a long distance and maybe couldn't get to school one day because of uh, transport difficulties or snow or inclement weather, they could have the, the lesson at home. So what we're advocating is some sort of uh, pilot studies in particular curriculum areas that these students in remote communities and traveller uh, could, could have um, a, a, a rich, a rich uh, experience without necessarily having to travel to places of study of every day. So we're advocating the ministry to um, promote a, a few pilot studies in, in chosen curriculum areas uh, where the whole paradigm can be explored more fully. Because it's only through the pilot studies that you see the, the issues that arise. I mean, often we're surprised at how quickly students can learn uh, when they're given the opportunity. Uh, and access to the resources, Absolutely. and teachers aren't acting as, as gatekeepers of knowledge. So those are system level recommendations. Coming down to the school uh, policy recommendations, firstly, um, we we found that schools were very um, uh, the, the, the they were very uh, uneven in the way in which they're able to uh, assess the impact of digital and online learning. And I think instruments such as the National Digital Competence Framework <clears throat> and Self-Assessment Tool for assessing levels of e-maturity have yet to be fully um, implemented and used at the school level. And uh, these instruments would allow for a more systematic follow-up in order to gather evidence related to best practice in digital online learning. And so best practice could be shared. So really the first point of the school level is, is, to, be, is to, be, to be more vigilant and to, more, to be more careful about the way in which they're assessing the impact, the impact in terms of teaching, learning, and achievement of digital, uh, the digital initiatives, first point. The second point is related to um, the ethics of online operation and net safe policies. We found that, that hardly anywhere was, was there uh, any net safe policies in, in, in place. Often we found very rigorous uh, filtering or even uh, rigorous uh, custodianship of the network so that students didn't have access hardly at all. In other places it was much freer and we didn't find anywhere a place where there was a, a net safe policy in, in place that, that would uh, in a sense define the parameters under which students should operate. And related to that is the whole issue of um, the ethics of operating online. Uh, I mean, there's a great temptation that what the evidence always shows, that all the research is showing, that uh, when in the early stages of implementation, there's a lot of copying and pasting uh, from, from the internet with, with a little regard for intellectual property rights and so on. And so there's a, a strong need for the ethics of online operations to be implemented and encouraged at a school level so that um, students don't just uh, cut and paste. There is a, a, a notion of synthesis. They're pulling together a resource from a wide range of sources and they themselves are putting them together to create new knowledge. I think that's the key to making progress with digital online learning, that, that it allows for new knowledge to be created. But um, I think teachers need to be secure enough to allow that to happen. So again, a kind of culture change. And the final point at the school level is to do with assessment. Uh, Elena was pointing out uh, in the previous few slides that uh, most assessment is summative. Even within the Moodle learning environment, uh, a lot of quizzes are taking place and so on. And, and I think that's legitimate. But in order to, to um, 
to fully appreciate the value of digital and online learning, we need to look at different forms of assessment and an e-portfolio approach where students are gathering resources that best work from a range of different sources. That seems to be the best approach and it legitimizes digital online learning in a much stronger way. It plays to its strengths rather than to uh, the weaknesses which, which many people can, can point to it. In other words, it, it, it gives uh, validity to the actual operation of digital and online learning where there is a great degree of student synthesis of new knowledge. So it's only through assessment that you can, you can um, encourage that to happen. What's get, what, there's an old saying in teaching which is what gets tested gets taught. Um, if you have a testing regime or an assessment regime which uh, uh, requires for example, student synthesis of new knowledge from many different sources, th then that will be uh, introduced and taught. So it, it's, a, it's a push pull approach really here for assessment. Um, at a school level, they need to allow the opportunities to exist for alternative assessment strategies, and the ministry needs to be able to validate that so that um, the, the whole operation of, of digital online learning becomes a, a valid and verifiable exercise which leads to qualifications which do students for the workplace. So that's the summary of our recommendations uh, at, a, at a system level and at a school level. So the question that we want to ask participants is um, how to plan and monitor digital online learning progress in VET organizations and there are five options. Firstly, should DOL be as part of the development plan? Secondly, should there be a report from the self-evaluation team? Um, should the national e-maturity model and self-evaluation question there be the key determinant? Uh, should there be indicators adopted at a school or a national level? Or is there some other form in which uh, progress can be monitored? If you'd vote, please, in the next 10 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. The votes are coming in there. If you'd like to make your votes in the next five seconds. And thank you very much for those votes. And let's just uh, look at the results. Okay. Yeah. Th th those, th those are very strong results, and, and quite clearly, a, a, a doll as part of a development plan uh, is 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 by far the, um, the strongest one. What we found was there was um, in schools a lot of aspirations, and certainly the school leaders were very strongly committed to digital online learning. But this was seldom manifest in a systematic way in the development plan. And it's only when you embed it in the development plan that uh, it, it starts to get, it, it's manifest because um, people are checking against deliverables there. And, and the, the, the other point, the indicators adopted at the school or national level, uh, it, I think is, a, is, is part of uh, the first point. In other words, uh, if we have indicators required within the development plan, for, for expectations. I think that will uh, lead to uh, higher aspirations and uh, an improved outcome. Michael, thank you very much for that summary. Okay, fine. So it's now time to look at the questions that have been coming in. And there's a, a very simple question, which I think you answer straight off, which is, um, what does the acronym OER stand for, Alexander? Uh, uh, thank you. Irena, for this question uh, that gave me the opportunity to recall that uh, from the control list uh, you have two handouts uh, available that you can download and uh, one of these two is uh, the project outline and the project outline is uh, giving in, a, in an annex uh, the formal definition that has been adopted for this uh, uh, exercise that is an international definition. Uh, so, to answer to your question, uh, Irena, OER stays uh, for Open Educational Resources. Uh, there is a formal definition from UNESCO in uh, this respect uh, that pointed to any resource, uh, whether this is uh, a multimedia resource, so it can be a text, uh, can be a video, can be uh, an audio file, uh, that stays uh, in the public domain or is a resource that is released under an open license. Here as well, there is a clear legal framework for open licenses, but 
in, in a few words, it means that you are authorized to use these resources and to tailor uh, these resources to the specific needs of your learning and, and learning process. Um, Thank you for that answer. Okay, the next question we have uh, is, um, and this is for Yelena, um, how did you define the school leader? Uh, are these head teachers or were they the proponents of digital online learning? Yelena. Well, actually, both definitions were used. If we speak of school leaders in terms of head teachers or school principals, whichever term you wish to use, then this is someone who's running the school. But if we are looking at the teachers, then we will be looking at the proponents of the process. You know, thank you very much for that answer. The next question is for Michael. Uh, fundamental question, really. Are there examples of actual transformation of learning methods and ritual that you've identified in the case studies? Any real examples of transformation, Michael? Well, uh, what, what we found, um, uh, I think, in almost every establishment that we visited, was that uh, a widespread use of social media is being used alongside the formal learning platform Moodle. And, and so, for example, in, in Niche, we found uh, some excellent practice where, where um, uh, students were taking responsibility uh, for, um, for their own learning and, and mediating through uh, Facebook as a, as a site. Now, Facebook has... Um, has many strengths and weaknesses, but but at the very least, um, most people have a Facebook identity, and and most people are able to communicate uh, very effectively through through Facebook. So, I mean, at a at a very simple level, we found, for example, Facebook was being used very extensively as a communication uh, uh, medium, uh, alongside the formal learning platform, and and I think it's it's in these kind of informal ways. That, that digital online learning starts to, to get traction in, in an establishment, and so, and so um, everybody has a, a vested interest in, in being part of it. And so the later doctors, the third of the teachers who say, it's not for me, digital online learning, I, I'm much too old to be involved with that sort of thing, they get sort of drawn along in the whole process. So there's that merging takes place between informal learning um, and, and, and the more formal sense. And, and, and it's in that way that you get progress happening. Thank you very much, Michael, indeed. So, uh, uh, I'm sorry if trouble. I may only add that we had yes. also an excellent practice from the school we visited in Novisad. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to special education uh, schools, uh, SEN is something that is very much dependent on technology. And in terms of assistive technologies that is being done in the school is Novisad, related to the digital and online learning, we also found some very serious examples of transformation. Excellent. Lovely. Well, thank you for that question from Pedro. Anybody else want to come in on this issue? Okay. I just want to endorse what uh, Yelena was saying, really, that, that uh, I think it's, it's in the area, area of special educational needs in particular where, where digital learning and online learning c comes into its fore because he, with uh, assistive technologies and devices, speech synthesis machines and these sort of things, um, the, the students get an access to a curriculum which they would have no other opportunity of having access to. And so that's a, that's a really strong example. And, and I think that the school in Novi Sad is, is a, you know, world class in that respect. Um, I, I, myself having... Uh, being principal of a school for special needs students, uh, I, I cannot honestly testify that, that, that the school in Novi Sad was probably am, amongst the best I've seen uh, in, anywhere in the way in which not only were they using the technology effectively, but the way in which it was integrated. And so it, it was a lifelong learning experience there. It wasn't just students to, at school age, but there were, there were involvement after school and into adult learning as well. So it was a, a genuine implementation at a community level. It wasn't just about technology. Well, transformational indeed. Oh, well, thank you very much for those questions. There um, is also Daniela that Mark, probably... Yes. Oh, please, Daniela. Yeah. Mark, I would like to return to the question on OERs hmm. because open educational resources uh, by term are not well known in Serbia, but there are already... Uh, databases and examples of existing OERs in Serbia. For example, one that is currently under development is National Repository of Agricultural Education. 
And uh, in terms of quality, uh, we believe that this uh, uh, OER will be good quality because all universities are, are participating in its development. And as far as OERs are concerned, there is a, a big issue on quality. It doesn't mean that everything that a lot of people put in a place, in an, in an online environment, is a high quality. It's, uh, it, this is a recommendation that we received from one lecture in, in Brussels that um, good quality OERs are something that we want and, and we should be sure that uh, what we are using is a high quality and that experts, yes. uh, a, la a small number of experts participated in the development of, of, of uh, such databases rather than large number of different kind of uh, lower quality, let's say, experts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Daniela on that point. I think there's a role to be a, a, a curating role, so that the, the um, uh, well, at, at a national level and at a school level, so that the, the old librarian role is, is, is an information mediator, uh, and, and it, they curate. I think publishing online process was that it's, it's very easy to get uh, into the public domain, whereas previously that go through lots of different filters and editing and so on, yes. all sorts of stuff goes onto the internet and, and some of it's bad, some of it's good and so on. So there's a really, really important role, whether at a national or a school level, to you know, curate these, these OERs uh, so that only the best quality is, is, is uh, generally distributed. Excellent. Well, thank you for those contributions. I'm going to have to um, pull the Q&A to the end unless we have another contribution here. Well, I would like to ask an, a question to Yelena or to, to Michael probably, because let's say the recommendations that you are making could be for schools from whatever type. Uh, can you tell us something about, let's say, what is particular for, for the, the vocational education training schools that, let's say, is, is maybe different than for, let's say, general secondary or primary or uh, other school, types of schools. Um, Yelena, do you want to go or should I kick off? You can, you can start and I'll then go. Okay, fine. Well, um, I, I, I've been doing a lot of work in the last few years on 21st century skills, work ready skills, and, and it's, it's in, the t in the TVET uh, sector in particular that um, the, the, the skills associated with, with being in the workforce uh, work-related skills, but skills to do with um, uh, self-actualization and, and, and research and um, uh, being able to, to drive your own agenda. Th these these work-ready skills are are key to being to be embedded at a TVET level, and I think it's through the, the paradigm of, of uh, an online environment that those skills can be encouraged. And so in, in VET, more than any other sector, I, I think digital online learning is, is of, of more relevance, or most relevance. Daniela, would you like to add to that? Yeah. Daniela? <laughs> Daniela? Daniela, sorry. No, uh, it was Yelena. Ah, Yelena, yes, it was Yelena. she was <laughs> Yelena. Uh, I think that we should also bear in mind that in the schools that we have visited, we have a lot of students who come, uh, come uh, from afar to their schools. Yes. So in those terms, digital and online, or online learning uh, makes schooling more accessible. So in those terms, especially if we have uh, in mind that many of the students uh, who are uh, part of the VET system uh, come from uh, lower SES. This is something that is very much important if we look at the continuance of their education beyond what is prescribed as uh, the entry point to school or actually exit point of the schooling system in mm -hmm. Serbia. Lovely. Thank you very much for those contributions and that interesting debate. Okay, we, we're running towards the end of our webinar now, so just to uh, summarize uh, the issues, uh, let me hand back uh, to Alessandro. Okay, uh, I will try to stick in one hour, so we have to really we have to go through very quickly to the point. Uh, um, let's say that uh, I'm making a, a I try to sum up the outcomes from the case study 
from the OECD report I was referring before, as well to the work uh, done by the uh, thematic working group uh, in Brussels with the uh, expert from the member states. And uh, I, I draw a few points that to me it's important to keep in mind. Uh, the first point uh, is uh, that we have really to be fully aware that uh, Internet uh, is uh, the mainly way to get uh, to expand access to knowledge. And here we are mixing the four formal and non-formal learning opportunity. And of course, uh, for digital nav native especially, but also for uh, adults, uh, uh, digital online learning uh, can really improve the experience and for the outcomes in the learning experience. But nevertheless, it is complex to introduce digital online learning methodologies and practices because it, it needs a holistic approach to be effective. It's not, as I, we said before, a matter to introduce computers in classroom or can get connected and get access to the internet domain. And uh, probably this is also confirmed by the polls uh, and the, your opinions. Uh, um, so uh, it's uh, really important that we take care of digital skills uh, on the one hand, but we have also to take care of, uh, of the pedagogical preparation of, of uh, teachers uh, for blending uh, co uh, traditional learning with uh, uh, with uh, this new technology opportunity. And uh, this is mix. Uh, there is not one size fits all solution. And uh, the teacher is, is key in this uh, modernization of the education systems. Also, thinking about to the poll, uh, the first one at system level, uh, there is a consensus. Uh, and this consensus as, uh, is also among the experts uh, I work with. Uh, that digital online learning need to be planned and monitored. And the framework we used is a, a, an excellent opportunity for self-assessment or even more complex uh, um, uh, forms and, uh, um, of monitoring progress uh, with, uh, with your practices. We focus quite a lot uh, on, uh, on uh, a lot uh, on uh, initial education, initial vocation education and training, and uh, but to me, uh, we have really to be ready for a future that is already here. It's about uh, the uh, thy lifelong long uh, lifelong learning paradigm and the fact that we have to provide access to knowledge to adults as well. Now, we had a question concerning what, it, what open educational resources are. Probably the most advanced example of use of open educational resources are what they are called as MOOC, the Massive Open Online Courses. And uh, indeed, you can find many, many platforms offering this kind of, cor uh, of courses. Some are not so of top quality but there are already very, very good examples of MOOC. This is, uh, MOOCs are really example of uh, knowledge access uh, of, to skill access for free. Last point is, uh, it's a really a recommendation uh, for, uh, for the ministry and uh, really to, for ongoing reforms and for future reforms uh, really I would encourage really to look at the opportunity and the challenges, of course, that digital learning is addressing to all of us. But this is the time to take action, in my view. Now, we have a last slide for you, where just to tell you what is next after this case study, what we are going, the case study will be published, probably will be available on. Uh, early next year in January, and uh, will be a form of publication, and uh, we will have the privilege to send uh, the the link to these resources. Uh, it's a it's a it's a case study where you will find very interesting information on on the progress of digital online learning in VETA in Serbia. Here, 
I, uh, we, we, we wanted to share more and more links, but please take note of these links because they're quite important. Of course, this is uh, my website where you can find information about that in general in neighbor countries, in the Balkans, for example. You might be interested. There is a link to the official website of the Ministry of Education of the Republic of Serbia. There is also a link where you can find information about uh, the European uh, thematic working group on digital online learning. And then there is Open Europa. Open Europa is uh, the most advanced uh, platform where you can find uh, MOOC, uh, you can find uh, the latest uh, um, research uh, and the latest development at the European level about digital online learning. You can register, receive, receive newsletter and, keep, and stay in touch with what's on, on, on digital online learning. I'm also putting a reference to the OECD report uh, uh, that I was referring, including the figures uh, about uh, Serbia. And uh, uh, this is uh, now ongoing uh, a course uh, for VET teachers uh, about blended learning in VET. And uh, this is, I would really recommend to go there. Future Learner is a, is a, is a, a UK platform offering MOOC, and this is a specifically a course uh, to help us uh, to blend uh, traditional face-to-face -face learning with uh, new digital online learning opportunities. The uh, last point is about uh, this uh, link to the adult learning in Europe. There is another social platform where you can meet uh, teachers from, uh, from other countries in Europe uh, and you can ex uh, share your experience uh, and it's focused uh, on adult learning. That's all. Okay, well, thank you very much, Alessandra. We obviously have recorded this webinar as well. So if you have any colleagues that you think might find this useful, we'll be sending the link to you in an email. So it just remi remains for us to... Yes, I, I wanted, of course, to really, uh, in, in a very quickly, to thank, uh, and I hope I do not forget any of, of the people and the, the, that were involved in this uh, in this very very interesting project of course i want to thank so the steering group uh, uh, that were really uh, supporting uh, in all phases uh, our case study work and uh, i want to thank so all the principals uh, teachers uh, and uh, and pupils uh, that we met uh, we had really in all schools uh, uh, a warm welcome and we found people, uh, the famous one third of people that really are willing to make things moving forward. And uh, this is very good and promises uh, for the VET uh, in, 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 in Serbia. We have to really give the opportunity to express, express themselves uh, and make the, 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 the modernization happening. Last but not least, uh, I would like to thank uh, 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 Daniela, Yelena and Michael. Uh, with me, we're carrying out all the project. Uh, and uh, I want to thank for the expertise, the input that they provided, uh, enthusiasm and commitment. Uh, we were a small team, but we were really uh, learn a lot, I think, from each other. And uh, all the best uh, for the vocational education training system in Serbia. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for watching this webinar. And indeed, we'll be making the slides available as well as the link to the recording. So it just remains for me to say thank you to everyone here in the studio. Thank, thank you, Mark. For introducing the event and thank you to our panelists. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.